Good afternoon. It is one o'clock Pacific time and we thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, returning safely to worship uh, co hosted by Church and Casualty Insurance Agency and Church Mutual Insurance Company. We're glad you're here. My name is Travis Chepkema. I'm president of Church and Casualty Insurance Agency. And we have with us today, in addition to our presenter, which I'll announce in a second, we have Eric Spacek, Brittany Bowie, and Matea Press uh, behind the scenes uh, with our question and answer feature. Um, we do not have the chat feature on for today, uh, but we will be taking questions throughout the presentation. And at the end, we will have a Q&A session. We will try to get to as many questions as we can, but we, um, we cannot promise that we'll get to all of them, of course. Now, the first question that is often, often asked is, will this be recorded? And this will absolutely be recorded. It's being recorded now. It will be sent to you via a link if you've registered. It'll be sent to the email that you registered under. Uh, it will also be posted soon to our website, ccia.com. Now, briefly, there's confusion sometimes between our agency, Church and Casualty, and Church Mutual Insurance Company. They both have church in the name. We are an independent agency uh, based in California, and we brought Church Mutual to California in 1983 and partnered together. We have a 37 year partnership, and we're proud to say that we presently insure over 6,700 houses of worship throughout California, Nevada. And uh, for our insureds in these crazy times, it's, uh, it's, I want you to know you're with a very financially stable carrier and agency. Uh, now, our webinar, as I said, is titled Safely Returning to Worship. Uh, this is a webinar focused on safety and risk management. It is not going to be addressing coverage or claims questions. Uh, we are completely empathetic and stand by you in uh, frustration and desire to return to worship as soon as possible. Uh, we found, unfortunately, we cannot get into what if uh, type scenarios when it comes to coverage or potential claims. And I'm going to let our presenter, uh, Guy Rusk, uh, give you the why behind that. So speaking of Guy, Guy is Assistant Vice President of Risk Control at Church Mutual. He is a chartered property and casualty underwriter and also carries the Associate in Risk Management designation. He attends uh, St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Schofield, Wisconsin, and he's also chairman of the board of Northland Lutheran High School in Cronenwetter, Wisconsin. So very pleased to have Guy with us and, and offering to do this. And uh, Guy, with that, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Travis. Appreciate that introduction. And thank you uh, very much to Church and Casualty for bringing us all together today. Um, uh, this is a very important topic. As you said, we're very empathetic to all of the churches that have had to restrict their gatherings uh, due to this COVID situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, but we're very excited uh, as we think about um, uh, how we can uh, support churches as we move forward and as states begin to open up. Um, Travis mentioned that today we're focused on safety and risk management topics. Uh, coverage and claims are very difficult to address in a large setting like this with a wide audience and lots of different um, items to consider. Now, really, from a claims perspective, uh, those are case-by-case -case situations that require investigation of the claims and the circumstances uh, and such things. So we're going to stay away from those today, but uh, we believe we have lots of good information here for you that can help you out as you start to look at how you bring folks back into your buildings and as you start up your uh, ministries and your services again. As Travis mentioned, I belong to St. Peter Lutheran Church uh, in Schofield, Wisconsin. Happen to sit on the uh, church council there as well. So I've been involved in our church's planning for how to address the situation. Uh, we also have a grade school attached to that uh, church and our youngest att attends that grade school. And then at the high school where I'm on the board, um, we've got two uh, of our high schoolers are attending there as well. So uh, in terms of understanding how much uh, houses of worship and really faith is baked in the community and supporting community, we understand that. And if you're like me, um, 
we're feeling it in our household. Uh, the kids aren't able to get together with their fellow students at school every day. They, they're still doing their learning online, uh, but it's a different experience, right? And uh, we're very involved in our church with many friends. Uh, much of our friend circle revolves around that. Uh, so the idea of community and faith are hooked together for the two of us, or for us and our family. Uh, so again, another reason that we're excited to be uh, seeing states opening up and becoming open to gatherings again. And really today, that's our topic. Uh, and we're starting from the assumption that you've already been taking care of your buildings uh, during the crisis. So even if you haven't been able to have guests and visitors, uh, you're still keeping up with your maintenance, uh, keeping things going. Uh, so we're not going to address topics like, uh, you know, restarting your HVAC systems or flushing your pipes if you haven't been using the water. You know, we're assuming you've got those things already. So starting from that point, then what we will be looking at um, really falls into three buckets. First, uh, how do we prevent the transmission of the spread of this virus? And, and that's going to be just a recap of things you probably have heard before. Uh, we'll spend the majority of our time really on preparation and making sure you have a good plan uh, that can adjust to changing circumstances. And then uh, at the end, we'll talk about what might this look like uh, when you try to put it into action uh, at your facilities. So that's our agenda for the day, uh, and we'll jump right into that. Uh, so when we look at how the virus spreads, um, there's really two main ways or two key ways that it can spread. And I'm going to emphasize the word can. Uh, that's person to person and thing to person. And the reason that I emphasize the word can is that even the CDC on their website today says that they cannot prove that the virus can be spread from a thing to a person. Um, now, while they say it hasn't been proven, they provide lots and lots of guidance on how to make sure that it doesn't spread that way. So we will talk about those things in terms of your preparations and what you should consider as well. When we talk about prevention, it really comes down to two main practices and four key numbers. So the two main practices, again, things you probably heard a lot about already, but distancing and disinfection. And just to put a little point on the word disinfection, different than cleaning, right? Cleaning is really removing soil, removing dirt. Disinfection is about killing germs, bacteria, and viruses. So we'll talk more about those as we go. The four key numbers that I mentioned are, are these. One is the six feet of distance. So again, been in the media a lot, but six feet of distance, if we think about that from the facilities uh, that we're looking to bring people back into, equates to about 113 square feet of space per person. To square that off, it's about a 10 by 10 box or a 10 by 10 square. Uh, now, giving that amount of space to a person is the recommended guidance from the CDC and other health organizations. When we think about that from a house of worship perspective, and we understand that there are family units that come to our gatherings, that doesn't mean every member of a family unit needs that six feet of distance because they're already living together and exposed to each other. So if you're looking, if you're a numbers person and you're looking for a way to use that six feet of distance or that uh, square footage number, add about 25% for another family member to that. The second key number is understanding that viruses, can, this virus can live up to seven days on surfaces. So the consensus seems to be it's more like three to five, but the reason I put the seven days here is because the CDC uh, recommends that if you've had a room or a structure that's been closed for more than seven days, you don't necessarily need to go through a deep disinfecting of that area because really the germs that were there aren't there anymore. You may still want to go through a regular cleaning anyway, more from that soil removal, freshening up, making sure it's a nice space. Uh, but really, if it's been closed for seven days and no people have been in it, uh, there's less of a concern from a virus perspective. The third key number is really understanding disinfectants and how they work. The key number here is two to 10 minutes of contact time. So we've got a link, and when you receive this PowerPoint, you'll be able to use that link to go to the list provided by the EPA of those disinfectants that they are recommending are effective against this virus. The thing to look for is to understand that contact time, how long does it have to be on the surface to actually kill the virus, and that will also figure into your plan of 
how, if you have multiple groups using a space and you are transitioning between those groups, how much time might you need to disinfect between them based on that contact time from those disinfectants. And the fourth key number is really understanding that symptoms show in seven to 14 days. And that again will be used as we start talking about how does this plan come together. And that's really the next step is putting together a good comprehensive plan but recognizing that the plan is going to have to change over time. There's two quotes that I, I love to think about whenever I think about planning. The first one comes from Benjamin Franklin, and he said, if you're failing to plan, then you're really planning to fail. And the next one comes from General Eisenhower. He said, plans are worthless. Planning is everything. So that might sound like I'm speaking out of two sides of my mouth. What, what uh, General Eisenhower meant there is that any plan that you have, the first time you put it into action, it's going to be wrong because something is going to change that you weren't able to consider. But it's that process of planning and thinking through what might happen in different scenarios that prepares you to react to what does change in the plan when that happens. We are recommending that you assign responsibility. So actually having somebody, tagging somebody with the responsibility for monitoring and incorporating the things that will be changing coming from the government and coming from your local health authorities and law enforcement. We're in a period right now where this is especially um, impactful. Again, it started, it was part of at the start when things changed very rapidly and new guidance was coming out almost hourly. And now as states are starting to open up, this, uh, the cycle of information coming out is accelerating once again. So it's important to actually have someone assigned or a group assigned to monitor those sources and bring that input back to your group to make sure you can incorporate it into the plan or changes you might need to make on the fly uh, as you're having gatherings. Also important to recognize the plan applies to different circumstances. So we know that events and activities bring people together. And if we look at the first picture on the slide at the top, we can see that in the past, the way people might have come together is going to be different than the way they come together in the future, right? This photo shows people being very close, they're touching hands. At this point, that is not recommended, right? If we go back to those key numbers, six feet of space between unrelated or, or not cohabitating individuals and minimizing touching to minimize the transfer of the virus. So we also know that spaces are different in terms of their size or their area and also the contents. The second photo on this slide, we can see that we've got padded chairs and hymnals on the chairs. When we think about this, uh, two items to consider. The hymnals themselves could be a transfer mechanism if the virus is transferred by things to people. So at the beginning of your gathering, you may want to minimize the amount of materials that people need to handle as they come to service or come to worship. The padded chairs are a reminder to think about what types of surfaces are in the area that you might be using for your gatherings. Soft surfaces are much more difficult to disinfect than hard surfaces. So again, if you're running multiple services or multiple gatherings and you have short time frames in between, it may be better to put the padded chairs in storage to begin with and use hard surface uh, chairs and then as we get uh, more experience with our visits, uh, with our gatherings, and as we start to see the threat of the virus starting to come down, then maybe bring the chairs, the padded chairs back out of service. We also need to consider staff and volunteers that are serving others. So there's multiple perspectives to think about here, not only your visitors and your guests that are coming, but also who are the staff and the volunteers that are serving them. And when we think about those folks, we wanna think about both protecting them as well as them, those folks being able to provide comfort to your guests and visitors. So in this case, thinking about things like, should the staff and volunteers wear masks or should they wear gloves in order to provide comfort to your visitors? So the masks themselves, what the CDC has told us is the masks are not uh, protecting you from if you're the one wearing the mask, but really it's preventing your germs from going to someone else. So if a staff member is there to assist visitors, perhaps you want them to wear masks to provide comfort to your visitors that they're not spreading any germs as a staff member. Um, gloves are a little bit tricky. The CDC right now, 
episodes that really focus on hand washing, or if you can't do hand washing, focus on sanitation, uh, sanitizer uh, versus gloves, because gloves can be difficult to know how to use and uh, uh, put them on and take them off in a safe manner. If you're uh, asking your staff of volunteers or thinking about that for that group, it's a small enough group, you could train them to know how to do that effectively. Again, could provide a comfort mechanism uh, to your visitors that are coming to your facility. While the subject is reopening and safely reopening, there, there are still some folks that should not gather at this point in time. So we do recommend that uh, vulnerable populations that you're advising them at this point uh, not to come into a large group gathering. Uh, you may consider doing special services for them where it is just populations that are in that vulnerable uh, set of criteria that are coming together. Uh, but at this point, the best, uh, until we know more and see how these larger gatherings go, would be to ask those in the vulnerable populations to continue to worship online, use your online services until we know more. The other thing the plan needs to consider is what happens if somebody becomes ill or starts to show symptoms while they're at your facility. And this is where we take a, talk about an isolation protocol. What are the steps you're going to take if somebody starts exhibiting symptoms during a gathering how will you make sure you can move them away from uh, the rest of the group as quickly as possible and as comfortably, comfortably as possible? And then how, what type of space do you have set up for those folks so that uh, they can stay there until they can be moved or you can move them uh, to a medical facility to get checked out? The plan also needs to think about what are the elements of your service and your worship uh, that may need to uh, think about modification. Uh, so we mentioned already minimizing the amount of materials that are being handled and uh, transferred between individuals during the service, perhaps projecting your service uh, and the readings and the songs versus using a physical printed bulletin or hymnals uh, would be better to start with. It's less to disinfect between services or gatherings, um, and it's just less to handle. It's another, it's a, uh, one thing to take off the list to worry about um, as you prepare. Substituting, uh, instead of using offering plates or offering baskets, maybe using collection boxes in the back or pointing people to online giving, hopefully that's something that you've already been utilizing uh, while you haven't been able to have gatherings. Uh, just a reminder here that almost every bank offers a free bill pay service that works very nicely for individuals to go in create the, the offering of the donation they wish to give to your organization and the bank will send that right to you. Uh, communion is certainly uh, uh, an item to think through as to how to do that safely, both from a distancing perspective, as well as a potential transmission uh, through the materials that are used for communion. Uh, there are a number of companies out there that are offering pre-packaged uh, communion uh, with with the wafer and the wine or grape juice uh, that are single use, uh, that might be a good option to think about from that perspective. And then certainly uh, worship activities, uh, many organizations use song and choirs um, and celebrants to help with that. Uh, we want to minimize the things that are getting passed between those folks, again, to minimize transmission, minimize the amount of items that need to be disinfected between services and between gatherings. So as we think about the plan then, though, that we're putting together, that plan is going to be uh, needing some supplies that support it. So certainly disinfecting supplies uh, that are used in your facility, things on the, the inanimate objects that need to be disinfected, but also disinfecting supplies for your staff and volunteers. So hand sanitizer, soap and water, um, and thinking about how much of that gets extended to your attendees. Covering supplies might also be something uh, that you think about that you might need. Masks and gloves, again, potentially for your staff and volunteers. Do you want to ask your attendees to wear face coverings when they come? That's a, it's a question, it's something to consider. If you do that, if that is your recommendation to them, then perhaps you want to think about supplying those things to them. If any of you, and, and many of you may have tried this already, if you are looking for these supplies, they can be difficult to find or if you find them, they might run out pretty quickly. Uh, so this is something to think ahead on. Uh, if you're, you, you know you're going to be opening in the near future, definitely get uh, started on purchasing this, these supplies already. 
Uh, of course, you do want to be careful with storing things, especially hand sanitizer as it is a flammable item. So just keep that in mind as well as, as you're buying those things. Having the plan is great, but then people need to know what that plan is so they know what to expect as they come to your facility. Uh, and uh, if you are like most organizations, you're not only asking your members to come, but you're opening your facility to guests as well and visitors, people that may not be on a regular mailing list that you have. So you have to think about how much you get the relevant details of your plan out into the public as well. So may you may not be mailing to can still understand how your service will run and what are the things that are expected of them as they come. Uh, so definitely email, uh, using your website. You might want to think about using your newspaper or those type of media channels that um, you, uh, aren't necessarily being used by your members or can allow you to reach those visitors and guests that you don't know yet. Uh, and definitely reinforce that message that folks who are currently ill or in those high-risk, vulnerable categories should continue worshiping remotely at the beginning here. Get some experience with how your plan is running how things go as you execute on these, and then as you start to feel more comfortable that you can keep those folks safe as part of your worship and gathering, uh, then you can open or welcome them back. And again, thinking about potentially welcoming them back as a group of folks in and of themselves versus adding them back into the general population again from the, the full scope of your gatherings. We certainly recommend not only communicating that plan uh, through media, but also having as much signage available as you can on site. So that if people were not able to read that communication beforehand, that when they come to your facility, there's guidance there for them. So they can understand what's happening, what the expectations are. If you're putting out hand sanitizer, are you expecting people to use it before they come into the building or is it just there for convenience? But thinking about how can you uh, use signage or project these things so that people understand what your expectations are, the relevant parts of the plan for them as they come. Uh, certainly, I don't think we can expect everybody to read you know, many pages of fine print as a visitor just trying to come uh, to worship at your facility, but signs like uh, some examples that we've placed here, I think are things that uh, can be very effective. So after having done the plan and communicated that out to uh, the folks who will be attending, then training is certainly very important for your staff, the leaders, your ushers and volunteers, folks that will actually be helping to execute that plan. Things you want to think about in terms of training, uh, we call it admission criteria. So is anybody going to be welcome at the start? Are you going to be doing anything that uh, might be assessing them as they come in? So certainly some organizations are considering doing temperature checks before you come into the building. Uh, that can be a great way to, to try to help find folks that may be symptomatic but aren't, don't realize it themselves and maybe ask them to come back after they, those symptoms have passed. Um, training on what the social distancing requirements really mean, right? And this one is, is an interesting one to think through because of that idea of six feet of distance of an individual but a different amount needed per family units and the fact that they can be closer together. So how are you orchestrating that? Certainly uh, some people in helping as uh, your visitors and guests come, helping direct them is going to be important. I mentioned that isolation protocol before. What are those steps? What are people, how should people, how should your leaders, the folks that are in charge of executing the plan react if somebody starts to show symptoms and where do they take them? How do they treat them? How do they make sure they're still treated with dignity and can make them comfortable as you're waiting to help get them transported to a medical facility? And then certainly the whole uh, protocol around cleaning, um, how to use those cleaning agents effectively, those disinfecting agents, the processes. You know, here again, the top photo shows hymnals in the rack. Will you be using hymnals or should you be training your staff and ushers and folks to take those out of the pews uh, before the worship begins because you want to minimize the amount of uh, disinfecting you want to do. Uh, on this photo as well, you can see the soft cushions in the pews. While those may feel great, they are much harder to clean. Um, probably very difficult to do it if you're having multiple services or multiple gatherings in the same day. 
So the training is very important uh, for your staff. Also making sure that they know how to keep distance between themselves and keep themselves safe from one another and with the materials they're gonna be using to disinfect. So let's shift gears just a little bit and start to think about, uh, got a great plan, now what does it really look like as we implement it? So we're taking a view of kind of before, during, and after services here. So before, and if you're having multiple services between those, actually going through and disinfecting the worship area, anything that was open for people where they could have used the area. And so something to think about too as part of the plan is do you rope off certain areas uh, where you're going to restrict uh, individuals from being so that you don't have to disinfect it between services. Any worship materials that you are using, if you uh, do need to use microphones or music stands, things like that, disinfecting those uh, from one service to the next. Restrooms and other common areas, you know, really thinking about can you skinny down the common areas so that you aren't having to do as much disinfecting between services. Of course, when you do that, that means you're restricting space and then you have to think about flow and how are people moving through that space and still being able to maintain the appropriate six feet of distance between them. So there are, there are trade-offs for these as well. And then replenishing those disinfecting and recovering supplies. So if you're offering hand sanitizer uh, to folks and asking them to use that before they come in, how are you making sure those supplies are replenished in between those services? During the services then, um, at entrances, certainly easier to prop the doors open uh, so that people aren't handling uh, the door handles. Um, weather can be a factor in that one. Making sure that as your ushers, leaders, or staff are uh, manning those entrances, that they're applying whatever that admission criteria is that you've decided is right for you, and providing hand sanitizer for folks coming in. Uh, hopefully they've done that already. Maybe they want to use their own when they come, but if they haven't or if they don't have it with them, having that available so they can use it before they come into the facility. Working on maintaining that planned spacing for the flow into the building as well as seating. Uh, we certainly recommend seating people from front to back, assuming your entrance is in the back so that people don't have to walk through a crowd to get up to the front. Uh, this may be very different for your congregation or for the folks that attend. Uh, they may be used to having their own special seating or pew, you know, their space. And uh, right now, that may need to change in order to keep everybody safe. And then modifying greetings, uh, the practice of passing the peace if you use that. Um, right now, again, at this point in time, as you're just getting open, practice the distancing and avoid uh, touching uh, between members and between attendees that aren't part of a family unit that's living together. From an after perspective, it's kind of the reverse of the going in. Dismiss congregants from the back to the front so that the folks that are closest to the exit are leaving first. So those walking out of the building aren't walking through a crowd as they're exiting your building. Also doing it at a pace that allows people to maintain that distancing between them. Uh, so dismissal may go much slower than what it has in the past for your organization, uh, which is okay. Give people time to get out to their vehicles um, and clear the way for others. Um, after the service, then disinfecting the worship area, any of the materials, the rooms used, similar to what you're doing between services. Uh, thinking about those frequently touched areas, of course, you know, light switches, door handles, um, railings on stairs, those types of things. And then after service is also making that hand sanitizer available for people that are leaving your facility, providing new protective equipment for uh, those that have post office responsibilities. So if you, if you are taking in physical offerings and you've got counters that need to go and count the money in, in the counting room, uh, potentially think about giving them masks and gloves as they're, they're handling things there. And that will also help remind them not to touch their face with their hands uh, before they've had a chance to wash those um, after that activity. Uh, we wanna thank everybody for submitting questions beforehand. Uh, and there's a couple of categories of questions that we wanted to work in answers here to the presentation. Um, quite a few questions around children's activities and should they start or should they not start? Um, this one is a tough one as well. Uh, children ages matter here, right? So the smaller children have a little bit tougher time with the impulse control and running up to their friends to give them a hug in the morning uh, or during Sunday school. 
Uh, so it may be good to consider holding off, especially in the younger grades, until school goes back into session. We will know a lot more as school administrators and school staff and faculty start to plan out how they reopen schools, and there will be a lot of good information coming out. So potentially right now, uh, the best idea is to hold off for now on children's activities and look to start those back up as school starts uh, back up again. Um, if you do choose to move forward with children's activities, the two Ds still apply, distancing and disinfection. Um, the, the four numbers still apply here. So trying to think about how do you disinfect those activity areas before and between the activities using admission criteria, right? Reminding people if their young ones are showing any symptoms um, of the virus that please keep them home. That's much better for them. It's also much better for the rest of the folks that are coming to the gathering. Uh, and then planning for activities that maintain that spacing. Again, this is tougher for the younger ones, um, can be doable for those that are older and, and can maintain that discipline of spacing between them. And then office operations. So um, while the main part of our conversation today here has been on gatherings for worship or for service, um, certainly you've got, there's some staff that is supporting your organization. Maybe they operate out of an office um, and these areas can be quite small and quite tight. Uh, so considering how are you allowing that social distancing to occur in those smaller spaces as well. Uh, we also like to talk about something referred to as 200% accountability. So 100% of accountability for yourself to do that self check on, do I have any symptoms? Uh, if so, I should stay home. Am I um, using proper hygiene, washing my hands frequently, using hand sanitizer if I can't wash my hands? And then in a small space, do I want to consider uh, wearing a mask to keep my germs to myself? So that's 100% accountability on yourself. The 200% comes from adding 100% for other folks as well. So if you've established protocols in your office that you are asking people to wear face coverings and somebody comes without one, you want to empower your, the rest of your staff to be able to have that conversation uh, that, hey, we all agreed to do this. This is something we want everybody to do. Please put your mask on um, while you're here in the office with us. Um, also think about what type of disinfecting do you want to do uh, between um, uh, during uh, over the weekends in your office spaces, if folks aren't there, you know, can we? Uh, are there things you can do to make sure that those spaces remain clean and disinfected so they're ready for the new week? Um, other considerations, other items, uh, special events, weddings, and funerals. Um, federal guidelines are out there in terms of those gathering sizes. This is going to change over time. So again, another reason to have your plan be very flexible. Um, playground use, uh, uh, so we're here in Wisconsin. Um, our safer at home order was just overturned. So really it's not in effect anymore, but many of the counties in the state are still uh, roping off or fencing off playgrounds. Uh, again, children uh, maybe aren't as disciplined in uh, the hand washing and then could be transmitting things uh, via the play around equipment itself or just as they're playing if they decide to play a game of tag uh, certainly could be uh, at risk for transmitting the virus as well. Uh, vacation Bible school goes along with children's activities you know potentially thinking about holding off on that maybe trying to squeeze it in after school starts or else looking to prepare for that in the summer of 2021. Uh, mission trips a little bit more difficult uh, because of the air travel that's involved and uh, uh, many of you are probably following the news stories on how the airlines are trying to help out with that but uh, probably makes sense if you can postpone it to think about um, pushing that off a little ways as well until um, we get back to a cadence and, and a comfort that uh, the airlines are going to be able to provide the space that you need to stay healthy. Security is another one that may seem a bit odd to have in this presentation, but uh, we always want you to be keeping security considerations in mind. Um, as we've gone without uh, having uh, the community of faith around us, uh, folks have gone into some dire straits in some areas and potentially uh, they may be looking for ways to take that out uh, for whatever reason on any large gathering that occurs. Uh, so you still wanna keep your security measures uh, 
high, you want to keep your eyes open, looking for things that might be abnormal where you might want to alert the authorities um, to not only protect from the virus, but protect from uh, other outside threats uh, as well. We do want to make sure that you know that there are lots of resources available, more than uh, what we've covered here in the webinar. Uh, you can uh, go to the CCIA.com uh, website. There'll be information there. Uh, as Travis mentioned early on, this webinar will be posted uh, to the Church and Casualty YouTube channel. Uh, if you have a safety or risk management question, you can contact uh, me or any of my staff um, at Church Mutual using our Risk Control Central team. Our phone number is there. Uh, as well as our web page. And uh, again, these will be in the presentation that you receive. And then we have a microsite totally dedicated to coronavirus information resources as well. So you can visit coronavirus.churchmutual.com. Also, there will be several pages of links to various good sources of information uh, as part of this presentation when you receive it. So I see we're about 10 minutes away from our time. Uh, that gives us a little bit of time to answer questions. And I can see here from our panelist chat, there's a number of questions coming in, especially around singing. Uh, and this one is, uh, we have seen uh, guidance coming out uh, from various entities. Um, the, I'm blanking on the name of uh, a musical association right now that had a study commissioned on this to find out what safety would be. And uh, right now they would recommend uh, singing in the group is not recommended just because uh, the droplets can become aerosolized and they spread even further uh, that would go beyond the six feet of distance between folks. So uh, individual soloists, I'm sure you could find ways to do that uh, safely, maybe even choirs if you're spacing folks out appropriately, if they're not turning towards each other, they're all facing um, a certain direction and that there isn't any part of the congregation in front of them. Those are some ideas that potentially you could use, but right now singing in general uh, especially as a congregation is not recommended. Um, looking at questions here, I see another one uh, on food. And what about uh, fellowship time, coffee time, uh, sharing some treats? Um, the CDC has not found uh, any proof that the virus can be transmitted through food. And that's part of the reason why takeout and curbside pickup is still allowed. That said, Food tends to bring people together, or they tend to congregate around the food. And for that reason, uh, we would say uh, don't start off with that. Maybe keep that for another iteration of the plan as you get more experience with running your gatherings, uh, keeping good distancing, and using the disinfection. A um, couple questions on restroom use and how many fit in there. That really goes back to that square footage and thinking about if everybody needs a 10 by 10 box. Um, how is your bathroom set up? Can you can people do that safely inside the bathroom? Um, otherwise, adopt the one for one rule: one in, one out, uh, and that's the way to use tight spaces uh, when needed. Uh, looking at some of the other questions here, uh, a couple on outside groups or rentals that are using your building. Uh, this one is is one of those where the guidance or the the things you keep in mind as you're renting to outside groups still apply, right? So you want the appropriate documents in place, uh, especially from a liability perspective of who's bearing the liability when they're in the facility, uh, and then you want to share with them your expectations for the two Ds: distancing and disinfection. Um, because you may not be able to rely on the group that's using your facility to uh, do both of those things effectively when they're in your facility, uh, you should also take it upon yourself to uh, create a disinfection protocol after any outside group uh, that you allow to use your facility. Okay, other questions that are coming in here. Disinfecting soft pews. Um, but, but the CDC would recommend that the best way to disinfect soft materials really is steam and using a steam cleaner to do that. That again, you have to uh, watch the pace of how quickly you're moving the steam uh, all over that soft material. Uh, so there is guidance out there on the CDC website about how to do that effectively. But because of the fact that it's a, you need a steam machine versus a disinfectant, 
That's why we would uh, highly recommend if you can uh, remove the soft surfaces for the time being that you, you use hard surfaces to start with um, to try to make that easier on you as you work into disinfect. A uh, couple of items coming in on um, outdoor services and parking spaces. So what about using outside facilities? Uh, one of the great things about being outside is if you're in a sunny area, and most of California is that way, the sun is a great disinfectant. So it certainly helps to lower the risk of transmission um, and kill the virus more quickly uh, if it's out in the sunshine. Uh, that said, we would still recommend using the distancing guidelines. Keep that six feet of distance between individuals or between family units. Um, if you are using any materials that people are touching, to still go through the disinfection process uh, with those. Parking, I think, is one of those that needs to be orchestrated again. So to the degree that you can, if you can allow people to park uh, in a distance that's six feet apart, so say every other stall as you begin, and then help them to know that as they're walking into your facility, they should keep that six feet of distance. And then as two cars have parked and the people left, that space in between them can be used as, as cars come in. That causes more orchestration for the dismissal to make sure that folks aren't having to bunch up uh, with their vehicles when they're out in the parking lot as you dismiss folks. That, that's why it's very important to share the expectations, keep the signage up wherever people might be on your property so that they understand what those expectations are and can um, fulfill those items for you. And I see that we're getting close here on time, Travis. I want to save just a little bit of time for you in terms of wrap up. I want to thank everybody again. Uh, thank you, Travis and Church and Casualty for putting this together, bringing us all here where we can share this information. Uh, we, we really want to see Houses of Worship be able to open up, but do that in a safe manner. Uh, and that's what we've tried to provide here today. So thank you, Travis. Thank you for everybody who attended. Thank you, Guy. And uh, again, uh, we had several questions come in regarding liability and uh, how exposed they are to liability. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we unfortunately cannot get into coverage or claim scenarios and what if situations. Um, they're too varied and too nuanced. Uh, I would encourage you to go to uh, our website, Church Mitchell's website. We have addressed general liability concerns regarding this. Um, excited uh, about the news out recently. Um, sounds like uh, it's going to be sooner rather than later for many uh, counties and the state to, to get back to worship. I um, want to thank Guy again for giving us uh, um, the tools and uh, uh, feedback on how to do that safely. We're sorry we had a lot of questions. We couldn't get to all of them. Um, we may try to circle back and see if we can address you directly uh, after the fact, our agency. Uh, but again, use uh, use the websites, use the resources, and again, the slides uh, and the and the presentation will be emailed to you if you registered uh, for the webinar uh, to the email address that you used, as well as uh, it will be posted soon uh, at ccia.com. So, I want to thank you uh, for attending, and um, have a great day, and be safe. Take care.